Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day to you today. Um, and happy 22nd anniversary plus one day to my lovely wife, Amy, who's right back there. 22nd wedding anniversary yesterday. Um, so it's good to see you all this morning and those in the room and online. Um, we're glad you're here today for this third installation of a live re-engaging theologies of hope. Um, just to summarize, if you recall, on our first week we looked at the book of Ecclesiastes, and I theorized that if you push back on Kohelet's claim that all is vanity, and you know, push back to that claim with saying that these things or certain things do have meaning, then you're on the pathway to hope. And I do think that is, in fact, uh, the direction that Kohelet would have us go with his method of teaching. Uh, last week, we looked at some of the theologies of hope that emerged uh, in Germany in the post-World War II period, particularly with Jürgen Moltmann, uh, Philosophy of Hope from Ernst Bloch, and others. Um, and we talked about one saying in particular that one of my professors wrote about. Um, her name's Nancy Bedford. Uh, she called hope basically little moves against destructiveness, uh, calling us as Christian disciples to at least do something to make a move for hope. And so I invited you last week to try and do something this last week that was your own little move for hope. Uh, and I hope that you were able to perhaps accomplish uh, something of that nature. Um, before I introduce our guest, I'd want to uh, share with you a bit of scripture, and then we'll pause and just kind of orient our hearts and minds in silence, um, and then we'll, we'll get on with our program, okay? So, <clears throat> from Paul, who I mentioned last week is <clears throat> a, a theologian of hope in a very real way, uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, this begins in verse 24, and now I'm realizing I should have brought my reading glasses, so, oh wait, it's on an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. <clears throat> so I invite you to take a minute, if you're one who closes your eyes, to pray silently or keeps your eyes open to pray silently or wants to sit or stand or lie down on the ground, whatever is the posture and position in which you pray silently, I invite you to do that uh, as we orient our hearts and minds. Creator Spirit, we thank you for this day and ask your blessings upon it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. 
All right. Special guest today is right here, Alan Whitley. Um, and I asked him to send me a, a brief bio that I could share with you. So he was born and reared in Nashville, and as he explained to me this morning, corn are raised, children are reared. His mama taught him that. Alan grew up in a loving home surrounded by a large Catholic family. He lives in Nashville with his fiancée and their four dachshunds. He's completed his undergraduate degree in social work at Belmont University and, not a month ago, graduated with his master's in social work from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, although those colors... <laughs> My father would agree with you. Okay. <laughs> He's worked in the field of substance abuse for the last four years and currently works as a case manager at Cumberland Heights uh, while also working as a therapist at a small private practice where he specializes in working with the LGBTQ plus community, those with spiritual religious issues, substance use issues, and anxiety. Alan and his fiance are members of Glendale United Methodist Church, and believe in creating space for all of God's beloved children. And during the last year, in fact, in the last week, I think, we voted on you. You became a certified candidate for ordination and is following his calling to be a deacon in the United Methodist Church. So will you welcome uh, Alan Whitley this morning as our special guest? And so what we're going to do, I'm going to, uh, we're going to interview each other. Um, I've, I've told Alan that I'm going to offer up some open and honest questions um, that I invite him to, to answer as he sees fit. And he's also free to ask me open and honest questions. And at some point, I'll invite you all to ask open and honest questions. Uh, if you want to know what an open and honest question is, is the type of question that doesn't have the answer presumed in the question. Now, th if you think about that for a minute, it becomes hard to ask an open and honest question. The principal idea is the question that you're asking is emerging from your authentic curiosity rather than uh, some type of purpose or agenda that you might have, your authentic curiosity. So in that spirit, I've known Alan for a while, a year or two, um, and we've chatted, we've had coffee together, we've stood on the sidewalk on Belmont Boulevard and talked on your last day of <laughs> class at Belmont, I remember that, mid-pandemic, uh, we stood six to eight feet apart and chatted, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I am authentically curious uh, in Alan and his work and ministry. Uh, so I want to begin, this is a, a really a, a softball question. Why four dachshunds <laughs> when one would do? <laughs> well, one day I decided to join Tennessee Dachshund Rescue Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And they post a lot of pictures on that Facebook page, and my little heart sees this dachshund that needs a home, and I now have four. <laughs> so one is, or three of them are, are, are dachshunds, and one is a Chawini, a Chihuahua dachshund mix. A Chawini? Chawini, yes. Is, are there room for more dachshunds? No, absolutely not. So your heart I, is now full. I took myself off of that <laughs> Facebook page. So, <clears throat> no longer on there. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I've, I've shared the bio that you, you sent me. Um, I wonder if you, there's parts of that that you would expand on to just kind of give us a sense of who you are, in particular, uh, this call to ministry that you have in I've, the United Methodist Church. Absolutely. Well, it's really good to be here. Um, I've been to West End just a couple of times, and one was actually, there was an open door here, uh, you know, during this last year. There was an invitation to come in and just be in prayer. 
Um, and that day I really needed it. And, and so I walked in and was able to, to come in the sanctuary and be in prayer. And it was, it was beautiful. This is such a, a beautiful home um, and very big. I didn't realize how, how, how big. We're on the fourth floor? We're on the fourth floor uh, of so the south wing or yeah, north or so west wing. I'm not sure which. But it's beautiful, and I'm really <laughs> glad and grateful to be here. So thank you yeah. for having me. Um, well, I was born here in Nashville, and I grew up in a pretty large family. Um, my grandfather was one of eight, very large Catholic family. I went to St. Henry and Father Ryan, if you're familiar, um, and uh, came from a very loving home, is what I always tell people. Um, I was very blessed to come from a very loving environment um, and had a great education and a lot of principles were instilled in my life early on. Um, we may get into this a little bit later, but at the age of 17, I hit some trials and some barriers um, that really threw my, my journey of life off a little bit. Um, and through that all, I you know, s stepped away from, uh, from my faith and from my relationship with God. Um, and then slowly found my way back, asking a lot of questions. Um, and I think we hear this word a lot. I went through this deconstruction and reconstruction period. But during that reconstruction period, uh, I found Methodism. And I walked into a Methodist church and my spiritual life really began to change. Um, and I, I hadn't walked into a place that was a open table and open doors and open hearts. I remember hearing that and thinking, what did, I've never heard that before. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was little things like that that I, uh, or maybe big things like that, that I, that I walked into that really began to change my spiritual life. But um, and ended up going back to school. I was a, I'm a proud adult degree student, is what I tell people. <laughs> um, I attempted to go to MTSU at the age of 18. Um, I lasted about a semester. Um, and then I thought, well, I'm going to try to go back, because I was 19. I was a little bit more mature. A semester and a half I lasted. Um, but at the age of 28, I decided I wanted to go back to school, uh, and I was really, really scared. Um, I have a strange relationship with academics and classroom and, and books. Um, it's a self-confidence thing. Uh, but I went back, I started at Nashville State, did two years there, and then transferred to Belmont, where I completed my undergraduate in social work and decided that I wanted to keep going. I did not want to take a break, because last time I took a break, it was 12 years. <laughs> so. Wanted to keep going, and I kept going, and I got. I recently um, completed my master's in social work, and really focused on the clinical track. So I have a lot of interest in, in individual and group therapy, um, and I'm very passionate about um, addiction and substance use. Um, and there's reasons behind that with my own personal journey, um, and so that's definitely a, a big passion of mine. So. Did I kind of summarize that okay? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, you've told me, and I'm taking you at your word, that you're an open book. I am. I <coughs> am. I did. I, I, I told, uh, yesterday I emailed him and I said, I'm an open book, and I have to be. Mm -hmm. I have to be an open book because if I'm not, what happens to Alan is that shame starts to kind of creep back up in my life mm -hmm. and some of those other character defects. So for me, being open and vulnerable, it's almost me owning and accepting uh, my journey of life. Mm -hmm. so. so in that spirit, um, would you share more about those trials and barriers mm -hmm. and uh, the, the starts and stops mm -hmm. as an 18, 17, 18, 19 year old? Yeah. What was that like for you? Yeah. You know, I think at, um, at, at 17, I, I I really, again, I, I ask a lot of questions. I still do. And I was asking a lot of questions then. 
um, questioning a lot of things about myself and who I was and what it meant. You know, f for me, it was always really important for me to reflect on <coughs> something bigger and better than me, uh, even as a child. Um, spirituality, re re religion, God, uh, I always wanted to know more about that, and I always asked questions, and um, at my a eighth grade, my did my career choice, we all had to write a small essay, and mine was on the priesthood, you know, I always felt this, this calling to serve in some sort of way in, in ministry, um, but at that time in my life, I felt like I had to make some really tough choices. Uh, there were certain things that I was hearing um, that kind of scared me, you know, and, and scared a, an adolescent, a 17-year-old. Um, it's already kind of hard being 17. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard. High school is yeah. tough. And... Um, you know, I was questioning a lot of things. Uh, one of those things was my sexual orientation um, and who I was. And at that time of my life, I felt like I had to make a choice. And for me, that choice was either you move in and you live into your authentic self or you have a relationship with God. So and one or the other. I mean, that, th that's what you thought. That's what I thought. Relationship with God mm -hmm. or your authentic self. Yes. Not together. They were no. separate. Very separate. Um, very separate. In and your 17-year-old mind. In my 17-year-old okay. mind. <laughs> <laughs> and that was really, really hard um, and really tough. And, and it really it took me to a really dark place, and it took me to those trials. Um, and... From then on, you know, I, I hit a lot of barriers and, and discovered substances and, and alcohol, and um, that almost became my higher power in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I kind of put God to the side. Um, didn't want anything to do with church. I, I didn't want anything to do with people who were going to church because I thought that you hated me or you didn't like me. Um, and so I had to completely separate myself from that um, and ended up in a um, not a good crowd. I ended up with people who were kind of walking through the same thing that I was walking through um, and discovering some of those same coping methods as I had discovered. Um, so from the age of 17 until... I was 26. I was in and out of treatment, uh, in and out of psychiatric hospitals, uh, well, hospital, Vanderbilt, um, and that was just kind of my life, you know, mm -hmm. um, very distant from my family. I wasn't allowed around my niece uh, or my nephew. Uh, my mom stayed up late at night worrying about me. I had an attempt on my own life. Um, while uh, living in Murfreesboro. My mom still talks about that, getting a call at 3 a.m. in the morning saying that your son is here uh, in Murfreesboro in the hospital. Uh, you need to come now. And, and her showing up and, and me having my stomach pumped. Mm. And I know we're talking about hope. Yeah. And... There's a reason you're here. There's a reason I'm here. But if I was to talk about hopelessness, mm -hmm. I think that, that moment there... That was hopelessness. That was hopelessness. Yeah. yeah. One of the darkest places that I've ever been. And on July 19th of 2013, hope walked into Alan's life. And, and I think Alan was just really tired. I still get emotional. Yeah. Sometimes when you, when I say, talk about it out loud, it, it creeps back up and you think about where, where you were, where you've come from, and where you are now. And it's more emotions of gratitude, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but... 
hope kind of walked in, um, and, and to be honest, I think I was just really tired. There's a phrase in, in the 12 steps, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. um, and I literally remember putting my hands up in the air, uh, saying that, that I'm, I'm done, and I need to do something different. And so that, that is my sobriety date, is July 19th of 2013. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious how you said hope walked in the door. I think the thing about one of the things about hope is I could still see people from a distance who I felt like probably had hope. Mm -hmm. And by seeing that, it made me thirsty for it, I think. Uh -huh. um, but I also think that when you see other people from a distant walk, we all walk through our trials, right? Everyone in this room, we all have, I, I call it my wilderness journey. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have our wilderness journey um, and so hearing and seeing other people walk through their wilderness journey and kind of come out on the other side. Um, I wanted that. You know, I, I wanted yeah. to know how you did that. Um, and I think it, it, what it did is it, it gave me this, this, this sense of, of possibility and that if, if other people that I knew could walk through their wilderness journey, then, then so could I. But at that moment on July 19th, I don't know that there was any other choice for me. Um, and and uh, th the truth is, it was um, it was either Alan was going to end up in trouble or end up not here anymore or Alan was going to get sober and mm -hmm. and do something different. Yeah. Yeah. What well, we we call that in the 12 steps you uh, locked up, covered up or sober up. Locked up, covered, covered up, up or, or sobered, sobered up. up. Yeah. <coughs> Some 12 step lingo. Yeah. Um it m listening to you um there's a, a professor at ILIF, which is one of our United mm -hmm. Methodist schools, uh, Miguel de la Torre, who has a book called Embracing Hopelessness. Mm. And his, the basic thesis there is that, you know, we spend all this time talking about hope, but not really having a connection to what that means. But what you have described is that your understanding of hope is like is rising from that complete hopelessness. Mm -hmm. um, so everything that uh, from your sobriety date forward is a sign of hope. Although I can only imagine that uh, from time to time that the darkness of hopelessness appears. Yes. Um, so I wonder, you know, how how in your current walk. You know, how do you manage that? Mm -hmm. I was actually thinking about that on the way here. You know, how it, it would be nice if I could sit here and, and say that um, you, Matt says you're, you're, such, you're, you're a hopeful and, and joyful guy, you know. Yeah. And, um, and thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I tend to, to be now in my life uh, glass half full kind of person. Um, but there's definitely moments, um, you know, when I, when I do feel that hopelessness kind of creep back in a little bit. Um, and the truth is, f for me now, it is being surrounded by a community of faith. Um, it is finding a safe sanctuary where I don't have to make the decision of being my authentic self and being in relationship with Christ. I think hope has a lot to do with trust. 
Uh huh. I think that kind of summarized hope for me. It's it's trust. You know, it's trusting the people around me. It's it's trusting the root of who the church is and what the church is. It's trusting God. And I think being in relationship with God. Marcus Borg talks about moving beyond belief into relationship. Mm -hmm. And I love that. That changed my life when I read that. Oh, yeah? Moving beyond belief into relationship. And I think being in relationship with God, that's what helps me in those hopelessness moments. Yeah. But also being surrounded by people in my community of faith. Being here, being with you. Oh. <laughs> Knowing you. you know. Well, I only know you because of uh, the offices of Amy. Yes. You know, who, uh, you know, quite honestly, um, you know, I had a, uh, a, a time of hopelessness with the church. Mm -hmm. And I, I left active ministry. Um, was that about two, three years ago? Um, and I would not walk in the door of a church. I felt like the church itself had uh, been such a wounding experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I experienced it from a, a different direction, I think. But nevertheless, you know, had that really strong sense um, that the church could be better than it is. Mm -hmm or it can be different than it is, or that it's not living up to the standards that it sets for itself. And, you know, over time as I investigated my own actions, um, you know, there, there are things internally too that, you know, I had to reflect on and deal with. Um, but Amy and the kids started going over to Glendale because for years, the bishop decided where we would go to church. <laughs> and so now, uh, as I moved into extension ministry, um, they were deciding where we went to church. And they went a couple places, and they ended up at Glendale, which is behind our house. I mean, we, David walks or rides his bike there, and you know we can leave two minutes before church starts and get there early. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> And what I found there is what you found there, mm -hmm. a community that accepts you for who you are, for just how you appear, that makes God in Christ available mm -hmm. in whatever ways you need to experience God in Christ. Um, so Glendale, for you, Method you said you discovered Methodism. <laughs> And in a way, you discovered uh, the, the branding of Methodist spirituality and open hearts, open minds, open yes. doors, uh, which some would say um, some of the hearts and minds and doors aren't as open as we would hope. Um, you, and I, I asked you in advance if it's okay to ask you this question. You said, again, I'm an open book. So in the United Methodist Church, uh, we have there's specific restrictive language in our discipline mm -hmm. about human sexuality, particularly, and this is the language the discipline uses, uh, that uh, homosexual persons are, in essence, not permitted to be uh, ordained. Um, I pray that uh, God moves hearts one day and we ditch that stuff. Uh, and become a more open and inclusive church in our words rather than just our actions. Um, but you have said you felt a call into ministry as early as eighth grade as a priest. And now you're continuing to pursue that call to ministry in the United Methodist Church through the deacon's orders, which, uh, just for your familiarity, the, the deacons, the office of the deacon is an ordained clergy office uh, where the person is uh, called to specific ministries of service and care for the world. Um, the office of the elder is typically the, the person who feels called directly to leadership in local churches. And so we have deacons serving in local churches, but I think 
a vast majority of deacons serve in settings outside of a local church uh, where they're extending the ministry of the church directly into the world. Uh, so, uh, Alan Whitley, you're now a certified candidate for deacon's orders in the United Methodist Church. Um, you identify as a gay man. How do, you, how do you, you've also talked about the separation of your authentic self mm -hmm. and God. And now these are coming together. Mm -hmm. Would you share with me, with us, you know, how, how you're working through that? Mm -hmm. And then also I'd add, how can we as a congregation of faith support you? Mm. Well, I'll start by saying that you and each of you and, and Weston has this morning created space for me. And, and I, I do think that that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. Um, I was listening to a podcast on my way home. I, w I just got back from vacation. Yeah, I got him off the road from vacation yes, to come in to talk yeah. with y'all. So. <laughs> I was reading the long email he sent me. Um, and I, I was listening to um, an elder talk about uh, having a hard time, you know, figuring out kind of what her vocation is within... Um, within the church. She was just kind of going through this deconstruction period and what she figured out was is that her, her calling is to create space for people. Um, and I think that that's like the very first step is, is creating that space. And the truth is is that growing up I never felt like there was a space that was created for me. And although there's definitely some trials and some uh, some barriers that, that we're walking through in the United Methodist Church, I have felt like there has been space that has been created for me here mm -hmm. um, in places like Glendale. Um, I had never walked into a church where I could be my authentic, authentic self and be in relationship with God. You know, I had never met individuals who had walked through their calling of the ordination process who were ordained and said, Alan, it is okay with who you are. And it is okay for you to come into this sanctuary and be who you are. It is okay for you to come into this sanctuary with your partner and be who you are. I walked into Glendale because of my partner. He's very involved in the United Methodist Church. He works for the United Methodist Church. And, and meeting him is what brought me to Glendale. And I can't help but sit back and say, thank you, God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that, that's God working in my life, and that's what I choose to believe. That's trust, hope. And to me, that makes my relationship with my partner a spiritual relationship. Because we, we put God first in our life. I tell people all the time we have a very normal relationship, just like any other couple, you know. It was a long ride home from that vacation too, right? We, yeah. We, we, we bicker like everyone else. We love like everyone else. <laughs> you need a vacation from your partner <laughs> I do. every now and then. I do. Isn't that right? It's, yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> You know, I, I, there is this hope that I have in this denomination and just in, in the universal church itself. I just can't help but think there's so much more good. You know, and I wouldn't have taken these steps to follow my, my calling if I didn't think that I was emotionally, spiritually, and mentally ready for that. You know, I, I'm, I'm doing this because I, I trust that God is holding my hand through this. Because I know that there will be people who will fundamentally disagree with me 
following this calling that I believe I have. I believe that God is calling me to be in ministry. And I tell people all the time, all I want to do is take those steps just like everyone else is. Yeah. You know, I've had the pool and it's been in my heart for a long time. And you can only ignore that for so long, <laughs> you know. Well, Moses tried to run away. Right? <laughs> a lot of people. Elijah tried to run away. Yeah. Um, Paul tried to run away. Yeah. <laughs> God has curious ways of finding us. Did you ever try to run? Oh, every day. Yeah. Uh, seriously, it's... Um, Brandon? Know, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, following that path is... Um, it's al- it always feels a little bit uncertain mm-hmm. um, because you're making this claim, God has called me to do this, uh, which is not a claim that you can make for yourself in the end. Um, the church verifies that claim through, I mean, the United Methodist Church has this long and extended process for mm-hmm. you know, making sure you're right. And from time to time, you know, people discover in that process that they were mistaken. Uh, And it's to their benefit, you know, that they discover that. Um, Because I don't think there's much worse in the world than um, following this this long path. Uh, And if you, you know, you go and get a master's degree, which the United Methodist Church requires for the ordained offices, um, then you're, you know, you're spending money as well, spending time. The whole thing can last 12 years, start to finish. Now that's a significant investment of lifetime and energy and funding. Um, so, but there's always that, that sense that, am I doing it right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Am I coming at this the right way? Am I asking the right questions? Do I have a call? Mm-hmm. This is why it's, I mean, you, you point to the importance of community as something that helps regenerate that sense of hope and trust in God. Um, and, you know, it's easy, especially for uh, clergy, and I'm going to say this to you all as uh, members of this church, uh, take care of your pastors. Um, because there's many days where they feel like they need a pastor too. Um, And, you know, they're trying the hardest they can try to do the work they feel like God has called them to do, and some days they feel like that's just not enough. Uh, So they need you as community to lift up and support them in that work. And so I'm grateful that you in this, this process of uh, going through certified candidacy. I remember I've, I've voted on you twice already. You want to know how I voted? No. Affirmative. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, at the charge conference where mm. uh, you were brought forward as a certified candidate, yeah. you, know, you know, one who's pursuing this ministry. And if I recall, it was unanimous yes. <laughs> at Glendale. And we were out on the lawn and it was a beautiful day, and we all voted yes as a community to support you in pursuing this call. And the annual conference, or the district committee then approved you, and then we heard about you again at annual conference. So you're on the path. <laughs> and you have this, this community at Glendale that continues to support you, mm-hmm. and you're gonna find new communities along the way. Um, one of the things I had in mind in inviting you here was God is calling you to do God's work in the world. Is that fair? Fair, yes. Um, Why do you think God is calling you to do God's work in the world in the United Methodist Church? Mm. That might not be a question. I mean, eventually, when you get through the paperwork that you have to do, you got to answer that question. <laughs> so I'm like giving you a heads up. <laughs> Thank you. All of a sudden, I just started sweating a lot. 
you didn't know this is actually the committee on ministry here today so <laughs> <laughs> that is a hard question um because i get this is what i gather uh from uh, knowing a little bit about you and hearing more of your story today is if the united methodist church didn't exist you know that god is still calling you to do god's work in the world right yes yes but here's this system um, that has so much good in it mm -hmm. that does so much good in the world yeah and you're seeking to be part of that what gives you you talk about hope and trust what about the united methodist mm -hmm. church gives you hope I th i'll start by saying that there is still a part of me that's that is questioning how and why did i end up at glendale and become introduced to this denomination that i knew absolutely nothing about um, i remember my first time walking in and i did not go and receive uh, because i didn't think that i was allowed to mm -hmm. um, there, there, there have been a lot of people in my life that have extended grace to me. Um, and I've learned a lot more about grace um, and, how, and how God has extended grace in my own life. Um, I was sitting probably three years ago in a in our um, one of our adult classrooms, but we were working on a uh, a small grant uh, for our our youth at Glendale, mm -hmm. and we were working towards how we can how we can grow our our ministry for our youth, and I remember sitting there, and there was a handful of of adolescents in there and and some adults and during that time um, an adolescent spoke up um, with tears in their eyes and they said to me that coming to Glendale was the first time that they began to have a relationship with a loving God and a God who knows them by name and, and loves all of who they are, is what we say at Glendale. And we say a welcome message there. Can you share that sure. with us? This, we hear this every Sunday at Glendale. And because of this welcome message, <clears throat> um, this individual um, began to have that relationship with Christ. I think that's just one of the most important things that we can give our young people. To look at them in the eyes and say that there's a God who knows you by name and loves all of who you are. And I want to share that with people. Because there's too many people, young people, our adults, who still question that. We should not be questioning. We shouldn't have to question that love. Of Christ. So my friends, this is what I'll share with you. That I welcome you in this space. This space that you have created for yourselves, for each other, for me and for Matt. And I welcome you in love and I welcome you in spirit. And I remind you that no matter what you're feeling or just not feeling, no matter where you have come from or where you are going. No matter what you have or don't have. No matter what you believe or what you may be doubting this morning. And my friends, no matter who you love, how you identify, or the color of your skin, you are welcome here. 
And most importantly, I remind you that there is a God who knows you by name and loves all of who you are. I almost think that that, that message kind of sums up what I think God is pulling me to do. And that is to look at people in the eyes and to remind you that God loves you. No matter your trials, no matter your wilderness journey, no matter who you love, no matter the questions that you ask about your faith or your hope, no matter if you feel hopelessness, <laughs> that God still picks us up and he says, I love you, my beloved child. I just don't think there's anything greater than that, and I want to share that with the world, because people shared it with me. And that's why I'm sitting here in front of you. You know, if people hadn't have shared that with me, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> people gave me hope. And, and, and the church gave me hope. And when I walked into Glendale, the United Methodist Church gave me hope. I have to keep coming back. I want to share that with people. And that's what I think God is calling me to do. Um, so I appreciate you creating this space for me to be able to do that. And thank you all for, you, you're instilling hope in me right now. <laughs> that's just the truth. I promise you that I'll leave here feeling very hopeful and spiritual. It's a <laughs> spiritual experience for me. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, Alan, thank you. Um, you are, I've told you many times, you're a joyful and hopeful person. <laughs> Um, and I, I say that and I mean it uh, because I, I have a, a sense of some of the trials you've gone through. I know your sister as well, so um, <laughs> yeah. you are a joyful and hopeful person. Um, and I'm just grateful that you took some time today to, to come and, and share with us about the, the hope that is within you that drives you um, to... God's work in the world. Thank you. Um, and I don't know where that greeting emerged, if it's something you created or co-created with others, um, but I miss it when I don't hear it. I miss it when I don't hear it because it is the gospel. Yes. I, I think that, that greeting that we have at Glendale every Sunday is a summary of the gospel. And uh, John Wesley would agree, I think. He's dead. Yes. <laughs> and I've seen his grave. Um, but, you know, uh, Wesley was um, radical about grace. This, the identifying mark of Methodism is our understanding of grace. Um, you may have heard it before. Prevenient grace. Um, not, a, I mean, you don't hang on every word there, prevenient. What does that even mean? Um, in essence, it is the hope that is already in you. Um, even when you feel like you're uh, at the bottom, that there's nothing else there, God's grace is already in you. It is a hope already in you, and in a very real way, I think that's what walked in the door yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, so I thank you very much for you. your joyful hopefulness and your courage thank you. in, um, in being present with us. We have just a few minutes, uh, and I asked Alan if this was okay. If you have any honest and open Jeez. questions uh, that you might want to ask. Yes, sir. Yes, he's uh, uh, asking, you know, how do you 
feel and sense this as a movement of God's grace mm -hmm. in your life? Yeah. It's a really, really good question. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that's just that it, during my, uh, during the process of becoming a, a certified candidate, I had to do what they call a river of life. A and I had to kind of, um, well, unfortunately, I had to draw it out. I'm not an artist <laughs> at all. I'm much better at, at, at sharing it and verbalizing it and, and telling it. Um, and, and I had to kind of write that out and uh, articulate it through uh, pictures and, and drawing. And um, it was an eye-opening experience because I really, it, it became more clear how much grace has kind of been a part of my life from the very, very beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I think, you know, there's, you know, we talk about that prevenient grace that, that is, that was just always there, right? Even, even when I was in the corner of a dark room and I was using substances and wanted absolutely nothing to do with God. And, and, and in fact, um, said some not very nice things about God, you know, and then there, there's that grace that was just still there. And, and I always picture, you know what I always picture is just Jesus with his ar arms just kind of open saying, you know, my beloved, I love you. You know, even in those moments, I think that's grace p playing out in my life. And then it going through that deconstruction to reconstruction period, it's really when I found Glendale and I walked into those doors and being, you know, just walking into that sanctuary and finding that community. Mm -hmm. Um and then grace played out in my life again, you know, uh, coming here and, and being being here and, 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 and being able to share with you. You know, it's helping me kind of work on my own spiritual life as it uh, as I hope it is for each of you, you know. And again, I think that that's grace playing out, just like you said. I love that you share that because I think it's so true. I hope I hope. I love that. We can say that. Yes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Grace is the ground of hope. Yes. I think we can say that. Amen. That's a sermon right there. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> um, it's time for uh, y'all to go to church, if you haven't already been. Um, <clears throat> and I think we're at 1045. Does it feel like we've spent an hour? Yeah, it went, I loved it. it, it went, <laughs> I really did. I could do this for and another hour, but I'll let you go to church. Uh, I invite you, if you uh, have further questions or want to have conversation with Alan or me, we'll, we'll be here for a little bit. Um, next week, I'm back. My, I have a different guest uh, next Sunday, Cecilia Alushula Tribble, and we'll be talking about hope and racial justice. Um, and so that'll be next Sunday at the same time. So... Uh, Reverend Alan Whitley, <laughs> Reverend Whitley, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And we, he's, we have time for questions if you yes. want to just.